Dr. Pam Kastner. I've been hosting these open mic nights here and there uh, just to honor um, how many folks were out there doing the good work to uh, spread the science of reading. And gosh, um, I'm telling you, these uh, speech language pathologists from Canada, our uh, friends across the border have just uh, moved mountains and they did uh, join us last month for an open mic. We did have an interesting <laughs> interloper. <laughs> so we thought, oh gosh, let's record this once again and uh, let's do it in a way that hopefully you won't have any problems like that. But so they're so kind to do this once again. Tiffany, April, Julie, I'm telling you um, what they have done, um, their journey into the science of reading. It's inspiring. You're in for a wonderful evening. I'm gonna turn it over to them and spend no more talking myself. So I don't know who's starting, but off you go and I'll keep letting people in. Thank you so much, Dr. Kastner. We are so excited to be back here again tonight. I mean, it was um, so exciting a month ago and to have the opportunity to share our story again. We've had so many people reach out to us and uh, we've been able to collaborate with people from different school boards, which we've absolutely appreciated. So we really definitely appreciate this opportunity. As you said, we're three speech language pathologists from Ontario, Canada. And over the past year and a half or so, we've really helped transform the way literacy instruction is done in our school board. So again, we're really excited to share our journey um, once again with you tonight. And our hopes are that you realize that you can also lead a really great shift in your school board, whether you're an SLP or a classroom teacher or even an administrator. You can definitely help make that shift um, uh, from a balanced literacy approach to instru uh, literacy instruction, a balanced approach to a more structured approach to literacy instruction. And you can do it with very few people, three, <laughs> and no money, <laughs> zero money. <laughs> And what we found is that what it really takes is you having a really great understanding of the science of reading, time, uh, lots of time, and a lot of love for emergent literacy. And that's exactly what Julie and Tiffany and myself have. We share a passion for reading instruction, a passion for sharing our knowledge with other educators and learning from other educators, and we definitely have a passion for teaching children to read. And because you're all here with us tonight, we know that you have this passion too. So our hope for this evening is that you learn how you can make that change in your school board or your district from the bottom up. So I'll just do a little more of an in, uh, introduction of the three of us. As you can see, uh, we like to dress the same sometimes. <laughs> You know, um, working with two people who are so incredible, as incredible as Julie and um, Tiffany uh, is like a crazy opportunity, but for them to be your best friends, it just makes, you know, everything about our lives and our work lives uh, are better because we're together. We, uh, we were speaking to Dr. Kastner um, earlier and she said like, you're like a well-oiled machine and we know each other's strengths and, and they know my weaknesses. And so <laughs> we know how to delegate responsibilities, but we, we care about what we're doing. We care about each other. So it works really well for us. So we um, work here in the school board. We've been uh, together. We have about 38 going on 39 years experience in our, our little school board. And we each have our own small private practice and we focus mainly in literacy right now. So you might be wondering like, how the heck did they end up here on open mic night? Once again, <laughs> with Dr. Kastner. Um, in my home, we call this the PAM call. And it was really interesting how it happened. We belong to some uh, different Facebook groups as I'm sure you do. There are some that are really fantastic and some that are a little less than fantastic but always the opportunity for learning and we spend a lot of our time like so many hours just discussing some of the questions that come up in these Facebook groups um, and that in and of itself is a great learning opportunity. So one evening I had just commented on a post about how we spend a lot of time teaching our, our uh, teachers to think in, in sounds to make that shift to thinking in sounds and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, a few minutes later, after I posted my comment, I received a private message from Dr. Kastner asking if we could chat. And I almost peed my pants, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm not lying, I, I almost peed myself. I was so excited, I texted the girls. I'm like, I can't believe Dr. Kastner sent me a message. So she sent me uh, her phone number. <laughs> I had her phone number. It was 
better than Sean Cassidy back in the 70s, I think. <laughs> and uh, I called her the next day. And when I was making dinner, we had just such a great conversation. And she invited us to share our story. So that's how it happened. And we're, we're so, again, so excited to be here. Um, when I hung up with Dr. Kastner, we did a, a three-way um, video chat and we were, we were squealing a little bit. Um, and, and that's really how our journey has taken place. It's texts, chats, voice messages, emails. It's nonstop. It's all day. We talk about the science of reading. Like literally we wake up, we text each other good morning and it's on. And Julie has little kids. So that starts really, really early for her. And I stay up late. So it goes, goes late into the night for me. Um, we do it during dinner parties. Um, workouts are like I'm I don't know how our husbands put up with us to be honest it's all we do um and we've really for the last you know little while we've stopped for a wedding or two and uh, a little sweet three-year-old who was <laughs> born but other than that we've really pushed forward with it so I know that there are people here from different backgrounds which is excellent um, so for those of you who don't know speech language pathologists are regulated healthcare professionals and we require to have a minimum of a master's degree to practice here in Canada anyway. Our profession is extremely broad and it, it, it is really on the weekly that we are reminding people that our work goes beyond the lisp and the stutter because we still have that attached to us. Um, we often joke that we call each other, we call ourselves speech language pathologists because speech language literacy, phonological awareness, hearing fluency, resonance, voice swallowing, pragmatics, cognitive communication, augmentative and alternative aphasia, social skills pathologists would not fit on our name tags. So all of this to say that our scope of practice is huge. And while we don't cover all of these areas within the school board, we actually cover a lot of them. So our school board is called the Catholic District School Board of Eastern Ontario. It is home to about 13,000 students. 30% of our students have been identified as having involvement with the special education department. Uh, currently, we have about 75% of our students who are in school for face-to-face -face learning and 25% are at home during the pandemic for either synchronous or asynchronous learning. We're still responsible for the kids who are at home for synchronous or asynchronous learning as well. So our team is made up of 4.6 speech language pathologists, Julie, Tiffany, myself work full time and our two colleagues each work four days a week. And we each service about six to 10 schools. Our school board or our district, as you may call it, is um, massive in terms of geography. So we put a lot of kilometers on our cars. And that's actually where we do a lot of our chatting is in the cars while we're driving as well. <laughs> Um, and so I know that the SLP services look different in um, Canada than they do in the US. So here in Ontario, our, in our school board, and with like many other school boards in Ontario, our role is a, cons um, a consultative one. So we do not provide direct therapy. We provide school teens and students with assessments and consultations for students between senior kindergarten, which is about age five, up to grade 12. Uh, but our primary focus is really that five to eight year old population. So in the past, our assessments were primarily focused on oral language, the use and understanding of spoken language, although we did screen for phonemic awareness and letter sound knowledge. But that was it. Literacy assessments were primarily the responsibility of our psych team. But the psych assessment was really more of a screening and didn't provide any remedial information for word level reading deficits. The reality was that these assessments were happening year after year, and yet kids were leaving our schools not being able to read. One of the reasons the gap wasn't closing was because teachers weren't being given the information they needed to actually intervene. But this was just the way it was done for so many years. So we did our best to get the word out there about phonemic awareness. We were screening it in our assessments, modeling it to teachers and parents, but we still weren't seeing huge changes in the classrooms and with our kids. We were vocal that we were in the classrooms to train teachers on how to train these essential skills, but the teachers often used our in-class visits as an opportunity to check email or do some other prep. And we get it, teachers are busy 
but phonemic awareness is important. And I know I don't have to tell it to you guys here tonight. So we noticed that the teachers would often then leave the sound awareness to us and wouldn't do it between our visits. They hadn't bought in to the magic of phonemic awareness. A real aha moment happened in the summer of 2019. Tiffany had been reading David Kilpatrick's book and suggested we read it. At the time, I thought she was crazy for reading such a dense book while we were on vacation, but I'm forever grateful that she pulled that book out. That book, coupled with the online modules, were eye-opening for us. I always knew that phonemic awareness was important for the reading brain, but I'll be honest, I didn't know how important it was. Our work had been so focused on oral language, we really didn't delve into written language. So when I finished that book, everything changed. All of a sudden, we realized that everything we knew from being SLPs lined up perfectly with the reading brain. We have a deep understanding of oral language and phonemic, aware and, and phonemic awareness. So all of a sudden, the phonics part, which we never really thought about before, made complete sense. We love speech sounds. And so it was easy to all of a sudden see the letters and letter combinations that represent those speech sounds. And so it started. We got our hands on as many resources as possible. At the time, we didn't have a budget for any con ed, so we had to finance it ourselves. We have bought many books, attended conferences like the Reading League Conference, and we're currently completing our letters certification. And Dr. Kastner, you have also been integral in our learning. So with all of this, our passion for literacy was ignited. And once we soaked up all of this information, we knew we could not go back to what we were doing. With the, <clears throat> with the realization that speech language pathologists are uniquely qualified to assess, treat, and consult on not only language, but also literacy, we knew it was time to make a change with the assessment process in our school board. Thankfully, our psychology team was in agreement, but we needed permission from the administration. So we got our chance in September 2019, when we were gifted with a new superintendent of special education. On her very first day, she agreed to let the SLP team take over the literacy assessments. So now school teams are able to refer to us for any struggling readers that they identify in the primary grades. Typically, the students come to us in grades one and two. We continue to complete our comprehensive oral language and literacy assessment. And for those SLPs out there tonight who may be interested, we use the CELL-5 or the TILS, depending on the student profile, the PPVT-5, and some informal measures. This gives us a really great understanding of a student's oral language base. But we added a more in-depth literacy portion. We decided that we wanted to provide staff and parents with two important groups of information, predictive and remedial. The predictive information enables us to see who is at most risk for reading difficulties. This lets us know who's going to need just a little bit of extra support to build their reading brain and who will need a lot of intensive to support to develop that one circuit. We get most of this information from the CTOP. And that led us to the most exciting part of our new assessment, the remedial information. It gives the educators and parents what they need to guide instruction and intervention, what they need to start building the reading brain. It tells them exactly where the students' gaps are and exactly what they can do to fix it. Teaching staff can immediately put the recommendations into practice and see measurable growth in their students' word level reading. To gather this information, we use the decoding subtests of the PAT2, the Words Are Way Spelling Inventory, as well as our own comprehensive phonemic awareness screening tool. We chose these test batteries based on the information we gathered from Kilpatrick's book. And given our limited budget for tests, we felt this would meet our needs, at least for now. This new assessment protocol was really well received. Teachers and parents loved it. They could take the information and put it to use right away, seeing changes in their students immediately because that's what happens when you align your teaching with the reading brain. But something unexpected happened, something we hadn't planned on at all. All of a sudden, entire classes were being referred to us for our assessment. And that's because so many of our young readers were struggling to learn to read. 
So that really made us look at what was happening in the classrooms. We had been so focused on our assessments and being student specific that we missed this major gap of things happening in our classrooms. Phonemic awareness and phonics weren't being taught explicitly in the front lines. And this was a pivotal moment that began our journey of changing how word level reading is taught across our school board. But we knew this wasn't going to be easy. We were just three speech language pathologists at the bottom of the school board ladder. And I mean, all the way at the bottom. We needed to be creative and assertive because we knew this was going to be an uphill battle. And so as our colleague likes to say, we had a big ship to turn. Here are some of the biggest obstacles we had to overcome. First, most of our teachers held a firm belief about how children learn to read. This entailed lots of guided reading with leveled books, sight words on flashcards and word walls. Our children were being taught to use those reading strategies that we know to be so ineffective and not at all aligned with how the brain learns to read. Skippy, the frog and the gang were hung proudly on the walls. This is not the fault of our teachers. They had, been taught, had not been taught differently and the Ontario curriculum supported the use of these strategies. And that's because our provincial curriculum is based on a balanced literacy approach. The literacy portion of the document highlights story retells, making inferences, predicting, inference, uh, predicting outcomes. Phonemic awareness and phonics are barely mentioned. In reality, this can hardly be considered a balanced approach at all. It's solely focused on the oral language portion of reading. And because our reading curriculum is rooted in balanced literacy, this movement is being resisted by some boards in Ontario. We were lucky to have a superintendent and a principal of special, special education who listened and learned, and they couldn't deny that we had to do this. So we we're lucky to be able to push forward with little resistance. But we recognize that for others in our position, those of you who might be here tonight from Ontario, you might be getting some resistance from management, and we encourage you to share the science with them. Like really, you can't deny the science. Another challenge is the teacher training. And we know you are fighting the same battle in the United States. Very few teachers colleges are educating new teachers on how children are learn to read. We see this as one of the biggest challenges we are facing. Then there was limited resources. When I say we had no financial support, we weren't exaggerating. We actually had none. That means we had to start and make everything from scratch. We didn't have a dollar to spend. And lastly, time. Time is an obstacle for any job. While, but while we were adding such a big role to our current one, we didn't have any of our other responsibilities taken away. We still had to assess all the children referred to us and to consult. We had to still had the pressure of a statistics and the need to make sure our assessment numbers weren't going to be reduced by this. We needed time to do this properly. And that's when COVID hit. All of a sudden, we had so many of our responsibilities taken off our plates, and we were tasked with supporting teachers. This was our chance. And so began our journey of changing what was happening in the classrooms. First, we had to target the teachers. We knew that the only way to achieve our goal was to as educate as many teachers as possible on the science of reading. We needed them to understand why they had to incorporate phonemic awareness and phonics into their everyday routines. Because to paraphrase what Maya Angelou said, when you know different, you do different. And if we wanted them to do things differently in the classroom, they had to understand why we were asking them to completely change their reading instruction. We didn't just want to hand them a program and say, do this. As April mentioned, we belong to several Facebook groups and we've noticed that there's a lot of talk about different programs. People want programs and app recommendations, but we wanted different for our educators. We wanted them to understand how the brain learns to read and to have a deep understanding of the basics, specifically in phonemic awareness and phonics, and to use those principles to guide their instructions. Besides, there was no money to purchase programs anyways. Our focus was on teachers, not programs. So we created and delivered a five part webinar series to our teachers and our school teams across our board across our board. And we knew that this was going to be critical in making that big shift in literacy instruction. If you're going to revolutionize the way reading is done your school board, you need to start by giving the teachers the knowledge and that's what we've not been doing. So let's go into the five uh, webinars that we put together for our teachers. So our first stop was the science of reading in service. And this was about a 90 minute webinar, unless I was doing it, it was two hours because I chat a lot. <laughs> and we led our teachers through the reading circuit. 
we introduced them to the reading brain and they learned all about the major pathways involved in reading. We needed our teachers to know that creating this reading circuit was not simple, that our students' young developing brains needed purposeful and planned instruction to get the circuit running so smoothly. We needed our teachers to thoroughly understand that reading is an extremely complex process and it involves areas throughout the entire brain, areas that we aren't born with and we have to create. Reading is the process of connecting letters to sounds and uh, meaning and the only way that these complex networks can run most effectively and most efficiently is with tons of practice and explicit instruction in phonemic awareness and phonics for so many of our students. But we also took this time to talk about the importance of the instruction being for all students, not just those we had assessed. This was really important for us. While we're part of the special education department and teachers were so used to us being uh, attached to the specific students and the neediest students, we really needed our teachers to understand that this is what all students would benefit from. And we found this visual to be incredibly helpful in helping them understand that. So 5% of our kids will learn to read quite effortlessly. It seems to not matter what type of instruction they receive, they're just going to, to pick it up. About 35% of our students will learn to read relatively easily with some broad instruction. They're going to need a few hints, but they'll be able to easily figure out that alphabetic code on their own. And that counts for only about 40% of our kids in our schools. The other 60% of the children, they're going to need more. That's over half of our students. It's such a huge percentage. About 40 to 50% of the kids will need uh, code-based, explicit, systematic, and sequential instruction to learn to read. Um, they need it laid out for them step-by-step step in order for them to crack that code. So that leaves about 10 to 15% of kids, and they're going to need that same code-based, explicit, systematic, sequential instruction to learn to read, but they're going to need much, much more of it many more repetitions, much more repeated exposure and tons and tons of practice. So we taught our teachers that this group is going to benefit from a structured approach to literacy, but for this group, it's absolutely essential. For 60% of our kids, they need this. This visual just was so powerful in helping our teachers realize that if we give our students what they need from the beginning, the structured literacy, we're going to be teaching 100% of our kids the way they need it. So they were able to realize uh, using the Scarborough reading rope that this is where the curriculum has been focused. Um, and this is what was missing. If we want our students to be able to use their fantastic language skills when they're reading, they need to know how to decode the words on the page. If you can't read the single words, then there's really nothing to understand. So with all of that information in hand, we went hard into what we saw happening in their classrooms. And then we asked them to think about whether or not that is aligning with the reading brain. And we shared some of the ways they can adapt their teaching practices to encourage that letter to sound and sound to letter connection, just like on this slide. We were actually really overwhelmed with the response from our teachers. So many teachers have been wanting this and needing it, but not knowing uh, what they needed and where to get it. So this in-service was presented to every school team in our school board with many extra opportunities to watch at it in. And we had teachers who actually um, tuned in two and three and four times. So by putting a focus on, our te on teaching our educators why phonemic awareness and phonics are important, that was the game changer for us. It was a game changer for our teachers. And most importantly, it was the game changer for our students. The why is extremely important. We can't stress that enough. Without this, we would definitely not have had the buy-in that we have today. The next in-service we provided was thinking in sounds. This one was super important because we knew that our teachers were really still focused on letters. Making that shift to sounds is even more difficult when your reading brain is already proficient. We decided that in order for our teachers to be able to teach kids the following a reading brain approach, they would have to have a better understanding of English speech sounds. So here's an activity we did to help our teachers get thinking in sounds. We'd give them a word like quilt and ask the teachers how many sounds they had heard in the word. This is likely easy for many of you here tonight, but I can't tell you how difficult this was for our teachers. 
People would be shouting out three, four, five sounds. They really weren't sure. The qu was stuck together. Some people even struggled to separate the vowel from the u sound. It's hard to shift from thinking in letters to thinking in sound. So we would help them break the words down into individual sounds, such as k, w, i, l, t, and then talk to them about the syllable shape. In this word, there's a consonant blend at the beginning, followed by a vowel and a consonant blend at the end. Here's a couple more examples of words we went through. Let's do this together tonight. Julie and April, I can't see the chat box, so you'll let me know what answers we get. In the chat box, tell us how many sounds you hear in the word stench. Like that sock has a pretty bad stench. We just need a number. I'm seeing five, five, four, five, four, five, six. Okay, so a, a few different answers. We're going between four and six. Uh, so in the word stench, there are five sounds. St, e, n, ch. So we could then give them the letters. St, e, n, ch. So the blend at the beginning is considered two phonemes. We see this discussion on the Facebook chats all the time. Is a blend considered one or two sounds? And it's considered two speech sounds. It's a s and a t. So they each get their own box. And then at the end, we have a ch sound. That's ch that represents that one speech sound, ch. So they go all in the same, the ch are both in that box. And now write in the chat box what syllable shape this is for this word. So you should be putting something like cbc with a c to represent a consonant sound and a v to represent a vowel sound. Seeing cc, vcc. Lots of C, C, V, C, yeah. C. It's, it's easy when those letters are there for you. And you're right, we have a consonant blend at the beginning followed by a vowel and again, a consonant blend at the end. So this is easy for you if you already are good at thinking in sounds, but for our teachers who are so focused on letters, it's very hard for them to make that switch. We'll try another one. In the chat box, tell us how many sounds you hear in the word monkey. Five, 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 lots of fives. People are good. <laughs> and that's right, there's five sounds in the word monkey. M, a, n, k, e. Um, they are M, O, N, K, E, Y, obviously. The N sound is one letter that our teachers have a hard time grasping. Most have never thought of it as its own sound. But the N, not, it's N, not N. We don't say monkey. And then we have the EY at the end, and it's in one box because it's a grapheme that represents the E sound, that long E sound. So for this one, the syllable shape is a consonant, vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel. These types of tasks might seem silly, but again, we truly believe that training the teachers to think in sounds is important, super important. If we want them to train their students phonemic awareness to proficiency then, and help them attach letters to those speech sounds, they have to be proficient in hearing the sounds themselves. So now that they had a lot of the why, it was time to focus on the how. So one of our webinars was on high frequency words. We started by educating our teachers on the difference between high frequency words and sight words. We wanted them to understand that a sight word is any word you look at and immediately know without having to sound it out. Because as many of you know, it's been firmly believed that a sight word is an irregularly spelled word, a word like the, could, or said. So we did this activity to really help change their understanding. We showed them these words. These are all part of an SLP's sight word vocabulary. I can look at these words and automatically read them. Some of the teachers were able to read a few of these automatically, like larynx or diphthong, but some of these words don't come so easily. This was a perfect opportunity for us to show them that what's in one person's sight word bank isn't necessarily in another's. And this allowed us to then refer back to the reading brain. To read many of these words, they had to apply their phonemic awareness and phonics knowledge. Then we worked through a series of high frequency words together and we divided the words into decodable, temporarily irregular, and irregular high frequency words. 
we wanted them to realize that many of these words they were previously having students memorize as a whole could actually be sounded out using early or advanced phonics. And then we were able to really think about and analyze those irregularly spelled high frequency words. We went through a series of words and we talked through them, really thinking about the one, sometimes two deviations in the word. Like in this example, we asked them to tell us the sounds they heard in the word about. So this word has four sounds. The first sound is a, uh. second sound is b, third sound is ow. And for some of you out there tonight, it may be oo. And the fourth sound is t. Now the second sound is b, and that's represented by the letter b. We expect this. Then we have ow. And in this word, the letters OU represent ow. For those students who have some advanced phonics, this is not surprising. Many words use the letter OU to represent ow, like out, house, or one of my favorite words, sound. And the last sound is t. And again, we're not surprised to see t represented by the letter T. So at this point, 75% of this word is pretty well decodable. But in this word, the first sound, the uh, is problematic. So we'd asked our teachers, what letter do you expect to see here? And many would say that we expect the letter U to represent the short vowel uh. But we don't spell it with the U. We spell it with an A. So because of that, this is the one part we need to remember by heart. And we taught them how to teach these words using the really great readings heart word strategy. This was an important shift for our teachers because many of them were trying to have our students memorize these words by sight without applying the phonological features to the words. This helped them realize that to support the reading brain, to build that reading circuit, they had to help our students match the letters and the letter combinations to the speech sounds. It doesn't matter if the word is decodable or irregularly spelled. The words need to be mapped the exact same way. So no more whole word memorization. So now we were on a roll. Teachers were understanding the reading brain and had bought in. So our next in, in service was an in-depth dive into phonemic awareness. We reviewed the reading brain, reviewed why having a proficient sound system is critical to building that reading circuit. And then we taught them six skills. We focused on sound isolation tasks like blending, segmenting, and isolating, and manipulation tasks like deleting, substituting, and reversing. And then we taught them how to target these six skills using our phonological awareness binder. This is a mega resource and it has everything they need to screen for and target phonemic awareness. Let's look at one of the skills here tonight. So this is the description page for isolating. You'll notice a suggested hierarchy of skill development, what's easiest, what's hardest. Then we describe how to target the skill, even giving a script and tell them what to do if the student struggles at all. All that our teachers need to target phonemic awareness is this binder, a tracking sheet to know that each student's level and a group of kids. We even gave them word lists for each level of the hierarchy for each skill. And we put a ton of thought into our word choices. Here's an example of the sound isolation lists. You'll notice the words are divided into those beginning and ending with sibilant sounds, those sounds that you can extend, like s, sh, and m, mm, and plosive sounds, those sounds that we make with a quick burst, like p and k, because we know that it's easier to hear sounds that can be slightly extended. Like it's easier to hear the first sound in shark than it is to hear the first sound in cat. And having word lists for each level of the hierarchy helps teachers to differentiate. 
Like with this example of sound isolation, you could have some kids isolating the initial sound, some isolating final sound, and some working on that middle sound. This binder allows our teachers and the students to work at their specific level, and they can use it in a whole class, small group, or one-on-one. -on -one. We also took the opportunity to teach them about pure sounds because I can't tell you the number of classrooms I've walked into where I've heard the letter L being taught as la 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 or K as ka. So it gave us the opportunity to tell them that when we produce the speech sounds in isolation, like t, p, m, or sh, it's important to say the consonants in their pure form. We need to ensure that we aren't adding any vowels to the sounds. For some students, for that 40% who will acquire reading fairly easily, this doesn't really matter. But for 60% of our students, this matters. The sounds need to be pure. So let's take a look at this classroom lesson that we suggested they use to target pure sounds. When we say speech sounds, it's very important that we say them in their pure form, on their own. We don't attach another sound. We know if we're saying the sounds properly, if our jaw stays closed. If when I'm saying the speech sounds, my jaw opens like this, I know that I've added an extra sound. I want you to watch. It, when I say the speech sound, if you see my hand jut down and my mouth opens too wide, that means I've said it incorrectly, not in its pure form. If my hand stays up and my jaw stays closed, that means I've said it correctly. Let's take a look. Did I say that correctly? How about this one? Bah. That was not correct. Let's try this one. Fa. I attached a sound. Let's go for one more. Mmm. My jaw stayed closed. I said that one properly. So with this activity, the teacher could be saying the sounds like in the video, or you could do the reverse where the students are in front of a mirror and the teacher yells out speech sounds for them to produce and they have to monitor whether or not their own hand moves. When we and last but not least, we dove deeply into the why and how of sound walls. I can tell you that by this insurface, many of our teachers had bought in. By now, teachers realized that word walls didn't align with the reading brain. Why is a child looking at the T that says T when they're sounding out the words like that, there, and they? They now understood the reading brain. Sorry, they knew kids think in sounds, so a sound wall makes sense. This is where you have a picture at the top to represent the speech sound. Like here, we have an eagle to represent the E sound. And underneath, we have different ways to spell that sound. During this time, we decided to actually make our own sound wall. First, we wanted to find a good scope and sequence. So we referenced a few different sequences and put one together spanning from kindergarten to grade two. Then we made embedded mnemonics. Sounds are important and the research is clear. Integrating letters with pictures helps children learn sound to letter relationships more easily. And don't forget, we didn't have any money, so we couldn't ask our administration to buy sets for all classrooms. So we spent a lot of time thinking about our keywords. We wanted the sounds to be pure and reflect our Canadian accents. We weren't going to use a word like egg to represent the eh sound, because when I say that, I say it with a long A. It's egg, not egg. It's hard to even say. And thankfully, one of us is pretty talented with PowerPoint and was able to make a set of embedded mnemonics. Like here, the letter B is embedded into a bat. The letter G is embedded into a ghost. And we use the keyword edge for the short E. See that little E falling off the edge of a cliff? We even have keyword pictures for the other speech sounds that aren't represented in the 26 letters of the alphabet. Like oi, ow, and zh, that sound you hear in the middle of treasure. Because we have teachers in most of our classrooms and our schools using these embedded mnemonics, if a student transfers between one school to another, or even when they move up to the next grade, they don't have to learn a whole new set of keywords. We have quite a transient population in some, of, uh, some areas of our school board, and this consistency is especially going to help our most neediest students. 
And then we gave them a script for teaching each new letter sound so that our students focus on learning the new sound or spelling. We encourage our teachers to use a routine, the same routine, for teaching each sound and letter used to represent that sound. Once students learn the routine, they can then focus all their energy on learning the sound or letter being introduced that day. And then came our truly game-changing tool, the sound wall. Here is the completed version, which, happens, uh, which would happen around the end of grade two. The idea is that each sound and spelling is introduced and explicitly taught one by one. We use the embedded mnemonics we created and additional keyword pictures and our recommended scope and sequence to put together the sound wall. We base the order of the spellings on the cards on the frequency that each sound and spelling is used in English. There are studies done on how often each grapheme is used to represent a phoneme in written English. I mean, how convenient is that? Beauty of knowing these percentages is that not only tells us what order to teach in, but it also guides us on how much time to spend teaching each grapheme. If I know the letters OU represent the OW sound 56% of the time, then I'm going to spend the majority of my explicit instruction on OW teaching this spelling pattern. I'm still definitely going to teach the OW spelling explicitly and systematically. I just won't spend as much time doing so. So when the SLP team was thinking about what order we would suggest that you teach each grapheme, we use this information about the most common spellings, the percentages, but we also spend a lot of time thinking about utility. We would say to ourselves, well, the percentage may be high, but does the grapheme appear as often in the words that new readers are encountering? By weighing both percentage and utility, we decided on a recommended order for teaching the spellings for each sound. And this is what our finished sound wall reflects. So here's an example of what I mean by balancing utility versus percentage used. Here we have the long vowel O with the keyword open. The letter O is the most common spelling used to represent this speech sound. It's used 73% of the time, but it occurs most often in the open syllable of multisyllabic words like hotel, moment, and focus. These words uh, our young readers are not yet feeling, being exposed to it early on in the decodable books, but they will quickly encounter the O consonant E spelling that's in, found in simple one syllable words like nose, joke, and stove. These are vocabulary words our students are more likely to know, read, and spell with. The same is for OA and OW. Young readers encounter these, encounter these spellings frequently. Look at those words, road, toad, boat, snow, bow, low. So when we considered both utility and percentage use, then does it make sense to have the letter O at the top? No, it needs to be moved down here to the bottom because utility truly does matter. So we took this into consideration when planning our scope and sequence and sound cards. It is still a work in progress. And as we work with the sound wall and create word lists and materials, we are constantly reevaluating this order. This is a learning process for us just as much as it is for our teachers. So at our school board, word balls are out and sound walls are in. So by the end of these, this five webinar series, we had even more of our uh, staff in schools, the teaching staff in schools and even principals completely on board with us. They understood the reading brain and they were so excited to get back to school in September to roll it out, everything they had learned. Because don't forget at this point, we had been at three and a half months of online learning at home as schools were shut down and then we had summer vacation. But there was the question, how were they going to do it? <laughs> so we started by going into the classrooms and training on our teachers on how to screen students and to use that phonological awareness binder to really blitz the phonemic awareness in the classes, as well as using the sound wall to target the phonics. We have spent hours in our classrooms making sure the teachers are really comfortable teaching these two critical skills. In previous years, we sort of popped into the classrooms here and there, and we were casual and not as assertive. So now our teachers know that these SLPs were meaning business. And as one of our teachers said about Julie's visits, Julie is, Julie is bossier than that bossy E because she does not take no for an answer. But that's why her, her teachers and her schools and her kids are being so successful. Our teachers were really happy and excited to have us because they were seeing results. This stuff works. So during this in-class training, we realized that teachers really struggled to put together words that went along with our sequence. 
So we created word lists to accompany our, our sequence. Then we recently added decodable sentences and even word lists for activities such as switch it activities. We keep building and building this resource bank. And we also give our teachers monthly phonemic awareness calendars to each month. One focuses on earlier skills and one works on later skills. These calendars are uh, posted in the classroom, but also sent home with the parents so they can understand the importance of proficient phonemic awareness. And we have them, if we forget to post it by the first of the month, we have people asking for them now. So the exciting part is that everything we've given our teachers can be used both in the classroom and virtually. As I said, about 25% of our kids are taking part in um, learning from home right now. So here's a photo of one of our educators targeting both phonemic awareness and phonics virtually using the materials that we provided to them. And lastly, we created an SLP share team. And this is a virtual space within our board where we can share information and resources with all staff members. It's where all of our materials and recordings of our presentations are housed and can be accessed by staff. And we hit um, over 500 staff members daily with this team. This has been such a rewarding journey. Teachers have bought in and that's because it works. The brain only learns to read one way and our teachers are now aligning their classroom practices with it. We are early in the game, so we don't have any concrete data on student reading skills. And don't forget, it's just our small team rolling this out. And of course, we're still up against a curriculum that insists on level readers and the assessments that come with them. But we're working towards changing that too. But what we do have is testimonials, hundreds of testimonials like these. Our parents and our teachers are excited. It's working, kids are reading. But just as important, teachers are asking questions that show they are critically thinking about reading instruction. We've been asked so many great questions, some that even stump us at times and get us thinking. For example, we get asked, why isn't GH listed under the th sound? And this question comes up a lot and gives us the opportunity to talk about low utility versus high utility spellings. We can't possibly have every grapheme listed on the sound wall. So we're able to talk to teachers about how GH is actually used very infrequently to represent the th sound, you know, in words like laugh, tough, and enough. But it also gives us the opportunity to tell our teachers that if it's a high frequency spelling for their class, then all they have to do is add it to their sound wall and explicitly teach it. Then people often ask us who decided that the Q would represent two speech sounds. <laughs> and I answer, I don't know, but I can tell you it wasn't an SLP. Another top question is, what's the difference between the two TH sounds? I know they're different. I see them two different ways on the sound wall, but I don't hear the difference. We take this opportunity to demonstrate the difference between the vibrating of the voice box for th, as in the word this or that, and the no vibrating for the th sound, as in the word thumb. We talk about sound parlors and how they are made the same way in the mouth, but for one, the voice box is on, and for the other, it's not. And you'll be surprised at how quickly students pick up on this. And I'm always surprised when I say, what's the word for what's feeling in your throat? And as some kid yells out vibration and it's like five-year-old and it just makes my heart sing sometimes. Then there's this question. Why do my students give me words like truck and tree when I ask them for words that start with the ch sound? And that's because of co-articulation. And let me tell you, it's an ongoing debate between April, Julie, and I as to whether or not this belongs on our sound wall. And finally, we get asked, is an ing one sound? Is it ing or ing? And this is a hard one for our teachers to grasp. But from a speech sound perspective, ing represents two sounds, i and ng. We encourage our teachers to teach it this way and to move away from teaching the word families as ang, ing, and ong. You will have likely read these exact questions in many of the Facebook science and reading groups. The N question, for instance, appears every week or so. Teachers across our countries are asking these questions because they are starting to think in terms of sounds, and that's good. This is an important step in their journey. We think it's very important to have these discussions with our teachers because it helps them think critically about sounds, letters, and their instruction. And in the end, whether or not their instruction aligns with the reading brain. And all this critical thinking makes us so happy because as Louisa Mote says, 
Informed teachers are our best insurance against reading failure. While programs are very helpful tools, programs don't teach, teachers do. And this is why our focus has been on educating teachers to think critically about reading instruction. If we just hand them a program, they aren't able to do this. So we're thrilled to say that we finally shared this information with our board of directors, the people at the top of the ladder. We needed to share our journey with them and to give them the why and the how, because it's far too slow to go from the bottom up. We need the top to buy in. This information and push needs to come from both the SLP team and admin. We have made a major shift in literacy instruction in our board, but we continuously have to remind ourselves that we still have a long way to go. We are just at the beginning of our journey. So we are going to keep pushing forward, getting this information out into all classrooms in our board. But we're also going to reach beyond our board. Through our newly created Facebook page, now we're talking to people all over the country about the science of reading and how to do this at their boards. Our mission is to help all educators really understand that one way that the brain learns to read and then to use this information to think critically about some of the current strategies being used to teach reading and ways to align their classroom practices with the reading brain. So we would love for you to join our page if you haven't already. Um, if you search on Facebook, our title is at the top of this slide. Um, we're, we're called The Reading Brain, Thinking Critically About Reading Instruction. So imagine three girls who had nothing to do with reading instruction in our board were able to roll this out over the last year. And all it took was a good understanding of the science of reading, some time, and a whole lot of love for word level reading. And you can do it too. We hope that you, we've inspired you tonight and that you've learned some ways that you can begin or continue on your journey of bringing the science of reading to your classrooms. Because if we can align our liter literacy instruction with that one way that the brain learns to read, then the sky is the limit. But please know this won't happen overnight. It can't, it's a process and it's going to take time. But by you being here tonight, listening, thinking about what needs to be done in the classroom to support that, then this is step one. We've already started. So thank you for having us here tonight to share our journey. We'll leave you with this quote from Dr. Kastner herself. Every child deserves to know the science of reading and every child deserves a teacher who knows it. And that Dr. Kastner says it all. No, I think you all, the three of you said it all. Thank you so much. Uh, just as inspiring as it was last month, um, what you have accomplished in such a short amount of time. And again, with, with no resources, but just determination and perseverance and commitment and dedication is just unbelievable. I am going to open it up for questions because there were some questions in the uh, chat box. Um, I know they're interested in your resources for sure. I saw that. And there were some questions too around um, speech production or speech sound. So Please um, just feel comfortable to unmute yourself. It might get a little jumbled, but um, that's okay. We're among friends. So um, if you have a question or uh, please, please, un please unmute. Or if you just want to say awesome job. like I, <laughs> I did see a question about the uh, phonological awareness finder. Mm -hmm. so we're, we're not able to obviously give the resource that we made for school, but we are working on a separate res resource. Um, we've been working on it for the past little while and we're, we're in good position with it now. I think we're, we're getting there. So there will be something um, in hopefully the fairly new, the fairly uh, recent uh, or near future. So. Um, I did see a question about how to um, uh, teach with, with um, mask. They were asking questions about that. And I think there's a question about superintendents too. And of course, I hope that you saw Maria Murray, <laughs> the amazing one and only Maria Murray said, hey, how about presenting at the TRL conference? <laughs> so that's so exciting. Mask, we do have um, the clear mask. So when we're in the classrooms and we're in the, um, uh, the front of the classroom demonstrating and the teachers have access to them. So it's a clear plastic mask so the kids uh, can see your mouth. 
it's challenging. It's definitely challenging, but it's doable. We've also had teachers create videos of themselves or the kids making each speech sound so they can put it up on the smart board and see the sound being made um, as they work with the sound wall too. Um, I know, just as before, there's questions because um, your web, the webinars that you created, which you said, you know, you have done hundreds of times, um, everyone's saying, oh, how do we get access to those? Or how would you share those? Because of course, um, I'm sure uh, they're amazing. And so yeah, th there is a question about that. Our, our hope is to definitely offer them. We need to uh, talk with our superintendent to get um, permission to do so, but that would be our dream. So yes, we would really like to do that. I think that would be the dream of everybody here too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thank you, Maria, for asking the, answering the question about uh, Dr. Kilpatrick's book. Um, is there, there are a lot of professional developments out there to learn and books on science of reading. Is there a training or book you highly recommend for teacher knowledge on the science of reading? And that comes from... Um, Julianne, and I'm sorry if I spoke for you, Julianne. Yeah. I found one, the one that I think works best for the teachers is the speech to print. It's laid out in a way. Kilpatrick's book is quite intense if you're not a clinical sort of get all that sciencey stuff, but the speech to print is laid out in a way that teachers can really relate to and apply to their classrooms immediately. Yeah, uh, the Reading League Pennsylvania actually did a book study of speech to print uh, a while ago, and we were so honored to have Louisa Motes. Um, launched the book club and also she attended each one. So uh, I also have a wakelet that has all the resources on that. So if anyone would ever want that, I'm glad to share that from the Reading League Pennsylvania. Uh, speech to print is seminal, it really is. Um, looking through, there was a question about superintendents. I think the question was, how did we get them to buy, how did we approach it with them? Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, well, we always joke and we even joke with our current superintendent that we don't quite know if she knew what she was consenting to at the and we're all about informed consent as speech language pathologists but we don't think she knew really what she was signing herself up for um so we just asked her hey can we present to our teachers about reading instruction and she said yeah go for it and then it mm -hmm. sort of snowballed from there so again it was one of those moments where we got lucky i think that we weren't uh, and, questioned. yeah and you went for it so it's more like uh, ask forgiveness before permission after that that right? is one thing we say often to each <laughs> other <Yeah. laughs> so far we'll keep uh, going with it there you go um folks of course want you to present to all the boards in ontario i saw that <laughs> i don't know if that's a possibility but that would be awesome yeah that would well, be awesome. it just goes to show you honestly um you know we always think that money is a barrier and certainly it often is but gosh look what these three amazing slps have done with um not not a single pen penny the last time we were together they were talking about going into um uh, a warehouse and repurposing webinar or uh, binders <laughs> because they were like we didn't even have binders so we were repurposing old binders so the binders were 15 years old even and we were pulling out old resources and recycling them and reusing those and and we would pull the binders up we used a white binder and, and some of them were so discolored we were like can we even give this to people is it going to look like we know what we're talking about but I'll tell you that binder is we see teachers walking with it and Originally, we gave each school one binder, um, and, and that's how we sort of started, and it would be hidden. So I needed it one day. I was in a, uh, one of my schools, and I said to the teacher, Lori, where's, where's your binder? I need it. And she said, go under my desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, unfortunately, all of our teachers have access to it, and a lot of our principals have printed copies for um, all staff members. So we, we definitely appreciate that support. And I'm grabbing that speech to print wakelet real quick while we're together. The, um, any chance um, you would have any recommendations for French immersions for teachers? And there was another question similarly about English language learners. Um, so the IDA, the International Dyslexia Association, uh, the Association of Ontario, has a whole section on for French immersion teachers. So we haven't personally checked out the resources there, but uh, that's usually where I guide my French teachers to. Right. You see a question there, there um, Dr. Kastner, about if we're doing the literacy assessment, what are our psychoeducational consultants are doing? So about, I don't know, girls, was it like 10, 12 years ago, we started this tiered level of assessment. Um, and so the grade two students had this uh, screening assessment by the psych team, but it was not, it was looking at how many sight words do you know, sight 
actual sight words that they were, that's what they had written down and a, a variety of things. And we just, we all knew this was not um, working. So when we approached, uh, when our new superintendent came into power, we again, not like that day approached her as soon as our other superintendent like had <laughs> was out the door and she was in, we were on top. And um, so our, our psychoed consultants um, do assess kids for um, learning um, or, or what we'll call learning difficulties and such cognitive impairment. Um, and so we really focus on those earlier grades, although we do now we're getting kids from the older grades, people are wanting this type of assessment instead of the psychoeducational assessment because it gives them the remedial information. Our hope is that we can, um, you know, eventually make this a, a tighter model for our kids but um so they're still um doing those assessments but they're focusing on the older grades and so when the the concerns are really their their acquisition or their learning of literacy they'll come to us so we can really look at those word level um foundational skills awesome a uh, question about because you guys are doing the literacy assessment what role does a school site play is there a dual evaluation is i guess this would be for kids who are at risk, uh, what we would say in the States tier three or beyond. So what role do they play? And then the next question was, do you have any recommendations for doing this online? So. Uh, so the role they play, they still do in Ontario, speech language pathologists cannot diagnose. So uh, they get the, our psych team starts psychoeducational assessments uh, grade three and up and they'll provide a diagnosis and a learning profile. So we see the kids before that for school teams that want to know how to fix it. Right. We give the remediation plan, the what to do about it, and our psych team really gives um, the overall profile and the diagnosis. Um, it's funny that the question about virtual comes up. We, we do these videos where we show teachers, what does this look like in a virtual format? It actually doesn't have to look any different than what it looks like in the classroom. Um, we have videos of us literally putting three dots in a PowerPoint and saying, here's your manipulatives, now go for it. So mm -hmm. it doesn't have to look different at all from what you're doing really in the classroom. It just takes maybe a little bit more prep. And I'm sure everyone's very aware of the virtual teaching hub from the University of Florida Literacy Institute, but if you're not, it is an absolute wealth of resources for virtual online teaching and uh, many tutorials. I mean, it is the place to go. Um, uh, question, how did teachers get time to watch the webinars? How did that come about? So we were lucky uh, because we started to roll this out while we were all working from home teaching online. Um, so teachers just had time in the spring and they were able um, to join. And then when we went back to school in the fall, because everyone was so excited and they, they had truly bought in, we would present 7.30 a.m., lunch hours after school seven o'clock at night like we we were so into it we wanted to share the information and people were coming hence why we gave the presentations over a hundred times <laughs> wow but see yeah there you go that dedication yeah thank you gosh you guys are just so inspiring all right one last question that i see uh what literacy is besides the assessment that you shared earlier uh what literacy assessments do you use as uh, screeners so we saw the, the ones earlier yes our assessment battery, I think Tiffany had said we um, use, it depends on the student. So if they're able to complete a till, if they have enough reading, um, then we go ahead with the tills, the C top, uh, the pat to decoding, nonsense word decoding. We use the words their way spelling list. And we had created our own um, uh, really in-depth phonemic awareness and phonological awareness screening tool. So we used that. If the child is not, doesn't have enough literacy, uh, the language we assess using the self five. And we also do a PPVT for receptive vocabulary as well. Did I miss anything girls? No, uh, we do have some teachers using screeners that we've recommended. So if they're implementing and they want to, you know, track change in their students, um, we provided uh, phonemic awareness screeners. We have some teachers using the past, Kilpatrick's past mm -hmm. um, screener. Um, and then I often refer them to the really great reading phonics screener, just to get yeah. a good sense. It has the nonsense word reading that mm -hmm. teachers can easily follow. All right, so we'll do one more because I know we're running late. So I do apologize, but you guys are so amazing. We could stay on forever. Um, how do you display and organize the heart words? So that's a good question. It is a good question. I don't know if we have an answer for everyone, <laughs> really. We're still trying to figure it out. We do recommend that teachers don't put them on the sound wall. We're really focusing the sound wall on the sounds. 
Um, some teachers have a word wall, uh, sorry, not a word wall, a heart word wall displayed. Um, we really talk about them as this is a process you use to teach the sounds. Putting them up on a wall with a little heart under the letter is not going to help your students recognize that word any more than your typical word wall. So it's really a lot of conversations about, no, no, this is a process you're gonna to use to teach them. If a student can't read the word, that doesn't mean they need it on a flashcard. It means you need to go through that process with them over and over until it clicks for them. That's absolutely perfect, Tiffany. Thank you for that great, great answer. <laughs> All right. Well, I have to say, I, you know, just like last month, I was just blown away. I was last month, if you were here, I was like, almost crying. <laughs> when I get off here, I may cry just because, you know, uh, what a difference um, the three of you have made. And you've just shown us um, what perseverance, commitment, and dedication can do. It's really just amazing. And everything that you created, and this, I said this last month too, you have created so much. Not only did you share knowledge, which is where we must begin and is essential, but you created so many supports for your teachers so they could transfer the knowledge that you were sharing with them into practice. And you were with them side by side, uh, with them every step of the way. And, and that's, that's why you're making such a difference. You are just completely committed. You are inspiring. Uh, and it's an honor. I taught them before we started, just an honor, just for me to do the open mic for them. <laughs> I said, let's come back in a year and you're gonna be like rock stars. You already are, but of course we wanna share best practice. That's what we're supposed to do, right? Mm -hmm. uh, share with one another best practices and elevate folks who are out there doing it. It's really hard work, it's great work, but you know what, when you're out there doing it too, you deserve you know, a little pat on the back and a congratulations for all the hard work. And um, thank you too, to everyone who came this evening. Um, we know you're working so hard all day long and here you are you know, in the evenings uh, with us learning more and, and sharing with one another. So thank you so much for being here. This has been recorded like they are every month. We didn't save the last one. <laughs> Uh, but we will save this one and uh, we will have it on the Wakelet, uh, I, I'm sure by next week. So if you just go to the same link uh, for the Wakelet that you have now, you'll have a handout as well as a recording of the session. And thank you again. Um, I'll stay on to say for a little bit with these three amazing ladies. Thank and you. Maria, how exciting. Um, thank you. That's amazing. Um, thanks for being here and everyone else. Thank you so very, very much. Um, I don't know what's happening in April. We'll see, I'll let you We're know. <laughs> I mean, we can go at the drop of a hat. Like we need like 10 minutes notice. <laughs> well, everyone's waiting for all those things for sure. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so very, very much for being here. Truly appreciated. Thank you all so much. We had thank such you. a great turnout. Gosh, God bless you all for being here. That's so, that speaks volumes about people. It does. What they want to learn. Yeah, and here they are. Oh my gosh, after working all day long. Thank you all so much. Thank you, ladies. It was amazing. It always is. Thank you so much for having us again. Oh my gosh, I would have you every month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh gosh, what a difference you're making, truly. Yeah. Fine. Well, and you know, like even uh, I said, doing it again tonight, um, it's just going to um, amplify